Americans. And I have the privilege of introducing Gisa Tanamuk and Shirley Hager this afternoon. Today's speakers met in 1986 at New England Yearly Meeting when Gisa Tanamuk, newly on his journey of reconnection with his own people and traditions, accepted our invitation to speak about native spirituality. He is Wampanoag of the Otter and Turtle clans from the community of Mashpee in what the settlers have named Cape Cod. At that New England yearly meeting long ago, Gisatanamuk was approached with some trepidation by a young woman, Shirley, on behalf of the newly formed Maine based Center for Vision and Policy, an organization whose mission was to develop a vision for the Gulf of Maine bioregion, one that would represent a more sustainable and socially just way of life. This group realized that any vision of sustainability must include the perspective of the indigenous people who had lived for thousands of years and continue to live in the bioregion. Gisa Tanamuk recalls being intrigued by this unusual intention on the part of ecologists and environmentalists, not only to connect to the land, but to the cultures of the land, to be in conversation with indigenous people, in this case, the Wabanaki, about what it means to be in right relationship with the land. Out of their initial meeting and a year of correspondence, rose the idea of holding gatherings of mixed groups of settlers and indigenous people to explore some of the most pressing questions at the heart of truth and healing efforts in the US and Canada. These happened over long weekends for several years. Assumptions were challenged, perspectives upended, and stereotypes shattered. Enduring alliances and friendships were formed as participants grew in trust of one another. This year, the University of Toronto Press published a book, The Gatherings, Reimagining Indigenous Settler Relations, authored by Shirley and 13 other Wabanaki and non-native participants, including Gisa Tanamuk about their experience and the learnings that they've carried from them into their lives. Each of our meetings has received a copy of this book, thanks to a grant from the Obadiah Brown Benevolent Fund. The lives of our two speakers since that initial meeting in 1986, bear witness to their calls to be engaged in the healing of our peoples. Gisatanamuk has been a tireless teacher and speaker among native and non-native audiences, has served as an adjunct faculty member in both the Native Studies and Peace Studies departments at the University of Maine. From 2013 to 2015, he served as a commissioner on the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He is a respected, dedicated, and much loved spiritual elder. Shirley Hager, who is a dear friend and gifted clerk of my meeting, Winthrop Center Friends, is a retired associate extension professor with the University of Maine and a Circles of Trust facilitator with the National Center for Courage and Renewal. Currently, she serves with Friends Committee on Maine Public Policy and clerks its Committee on Tribal State Relations. She has been a tireless advocate for the rights of the Indigenous peoples of Maine and has dedicated the last 13 years of her life to birthing the Gatherings book. I remember during worship one Sunday when Shirley shared with us her sense of the spiritual motion toward healing, which is integral to life. We see it in how nature reclaims areas of devastation, how wounds heal. We can invite that spirit of healing to work in us and through us. We all have healing work to do separate and together from the legacy of colonialism, 
which serves to perpetuate the ongoing oppression of indigenous peoples, as well as to diminish our own lives. Beginning to heal the wounds of our past is necessary for the spiritual well-being of us all. We gather together as a yearly meeting this year to explore how we are individually and corporately called to be a part of the healing. So welcome Gisa Tanamuk and Shirley, and thank you for the gift of your presence, your knowledge, and your wisdom. I invite us now to enter into the sacred space of this time, centered in spirit, and open ourselves to the message these friends bring us. Gisa Tanamuk and Shirley will speak out of the silence as they are ready. Well, thank you, Maggie, for that beautiful introduction. And um, I wanna thank all the elders who are holding us today during this plenary. Um, I, I also wanna thank Leslie Manning for that very personal and profound land acknowledgement this morning. And um, Gisatanamuk, after the uh, land acknowledgement, they played your cousin Hawk's video. <laughs> Nice photos, photos and his music. It was absolutely beautiful and a wonderful way to bring us closer into this relationship with the land and one another this week. Well, here we well, are. Here we are. <laughs> After all this time. <laughs> You know, I, I wanted to, uh, to to share a little bit of an experience. Uh, I, I don't know if you ever recalled uh, Sam Augustine. I do very well. Well, he had never been to a Quaker meeting before. And we had a, a, a meeting uh, somewhere between Amherst and in, uh, in, in, uh, Tatamagush. And uh, so, we, you know, how the meetings usually start in, in quiet and silence. You know, and, and I was sitting next to Sam. And uh, after a while, he leans over to me quietly and says, I have to break the ice and started telling jokes. <laughs> it was a real pleasant moment, you know. <laughs> well, like we were honoring the silence this morning. I didn't yeah, know yeah. we were live, so. <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> yeah, good thing I didn't say anything embarrassing. Eh? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, I thought it might be good um, to begin by each one of us just um, sharing why we wanted to accept this invitation um, mm -hmm. that I feel so honored to have been given from New England Yearly Meeting. But I thought, I, I thought that'd be a good way, good way to start. Sure. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Why don't you go? <laughs> ah, of course. <laughs> um, uh, first to acknowledge um, the ancestors of, our bo of us both, our mutual ancestors. And I want to do it in, um, in, in very brief. But, um, um, but to employ Wampanoag protocols. I'm going to say this briefly in my language, but what I'm alluding to is a Thanksgiving, a very deep Thanksgiving, a real Thanksgiving mm -hmm. um, in gratitude for all that, uh, all that lives around us, for our friendship and our continuing uh, stay in this realm of creation, you know, that, that all continues to strive for wellness and peace. In a Cheha, Neganishik, Talbot, Nitashuaji, no, he would not come young. Kushkimunati of Hajina, watching us young Gashkano Wajina, now make on Tamkanawana to us in this no Pazuk, this no Tiakana. 
Tava ne wachon is no money to walk in that old chin unto us. Kirtan, wachon unto us in Nenu Gato Temanuk. Now, oh, I didn't know you want up come yonk. Pishpamunta muna no sion cascana nuta. A dark yellow you watch in a scoe cousin. A scoe cousin. A scoe cousin. A scoe cousin. A jar. But uh, why I accepted this was was really easy for me because I have a, a, a very deep gratitude and affection for Quakers. Um, we have a long history together, Wampanoag people and Quakers. And um, uh, I recall the, 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 I was visiting the state house one time because the Massachusetts Commission in Indian Affairs was located near the state house and, and uh, I was staff there. Uh, Why well, I became staff at some point, but um, I was I was going to the state house and there was this statue of Anne Hutchinson, and uh, and I was and I read the encrypt, encryption there and I was just so so shocked about the level of persecution that that Quakers were going through. Um, so I, I always carried that in my mind. And, and then um, over the years, I began to realize that, that um, in the, the town of Sandwich, which borders Mashpee, uh, is a friend's meeting house, you know? And so we started to have, um, you, know, you know, meeting each other and being invited to speak and so forth. And then there, then there came the Mashpee land claim um, and, you know, it's such a, 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 you know, one of these uncontrollable mob kind of reactions to something that shouldn't have been, but, but clearly was, you know, so there was this mass hysteria that, that was being prompted by the state of Massachusetts in the, uh, in the banks that the land claim represented a devastation to the economy and, and so forth. So, and that, that, that really spawned a lot of violent reactions to, to Wampanoag people in Mashpee. And uh, even though we, we never thought about inviting anybody to, to, uh, you know, to work at the truths of the situation, because we were saying this land claim was not about to, dispose of anybody from their homes and, and, and so forth. But the, um, uh, the Sandwich chapter of American Friends um, took it upon themselves to investigate whether or not this, this, this is, our land claims really posed um, that kind of a, a, a threat. And, um, and they really deeply investigated all aspects of it. And, and, and then they filed their report and made it very public that this land claim had nothing to do with disposing people of their homes and, and really aligned all the fears that uh, was being conjured up kind of thing, you know? And I had such great deep appreciation for that. So, you know, and over the times, you know, I mean, the fact that my first public speaking engagement took place in front of the, the American Friends yearly meeting kind of thing, New, New England yearly meeting and where we met. And, uh, you know, so accepting this was was uh, a no brainer for me. You know, I was more readily and happy to do what I can to show my, my gratitude in my continuing relationship to the American Friends. So that's why I'm here. And I'm so glad you are. And I guess I would respond to that by saying that this is my community. And um, even before the gatherings that uh, took place in the 1980s and 90s, Quakers were searching for ways to make things right um, between our peoples. Um, Quakers were a strong presence at our gatherings and their support has totally surrounded our book. Um, I also accepted because you would, 
you said you would do this with me, which was really important. And it felt that the fact that our connection began at New England Yearly Meeting and all these years later, coming back full circle, um, it feels like a giving back to this community for us to be here. Um, you know, I thought, uh, referring back to those gatherings that, that Maggie mentioned, um, they were um, long weekends that we, um, we first, uh, after our meeting at New England Yearly Meeting, we first conceived of as, as a way to educate non-Native people in Maine and the Maritimes. And then they grew into something much, much bigger than that. And I just thought it would be maybe instructive for us to talk a little bit about what drew us to those gatherings. Um, you might say what called us to those gatherings and why we kept coming back. Um, would you care to reflect on, on that? What, why did you get involved and what kept you engaged? Well, it was, uh, well, you know, as, as it was said earlier, I was intrigued with the, uh, <laughs> the proposition that, because I, you know, I, I never heard that coming from, from anybody outside of Indian country, you know, that they wanted to, have a relationship with the land, which is, you know, fairly common, uh, but to also include the cultures that come from the land, and that's what was intriguing to me. That wow, there's a uh, there's some kind of transition going on here, and, and, the, and, the, and I really welcome that. Uh, and you know, and noting that you know, I'm, I'm from I'm from uh, Mashpee Wampanoag, and I'm not. In the in the in the area where the center for vision policy was, so and I had a lot of contacts, you know, uh, even in those days. You know, I mean, I have a forty-year relationship with the Wabanaki, you know, and that that spans the the whole expanse of territories in Wabanaki, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had contacts, you know, and, and you know, in, in trusted friends. So I thought that, you know, it, it's initially a conversation between the Center for Vision Policy and the Wabanaki of the area. And uh, you know, not so surprising, you know, that the Center for Vision Policy, CVP, didn't really have many contacts, you know, and so it was a, a, a really open door for me to uh, enrich this conversation by calling into some of my friends at, uh, and, and they trusted me in this, you know, and so uh, that was the initial drive was to, to uh, I, I guess, to, to marry both ends together. And then, uh, and, and then my attention was to kind of drop out and let, let the conversation go, you know, kind of thing. So I wasn't thinking <laughs> that I was going to be with this since, since then, but. Forever. <laughs> But you know, it's a good journey. It's a good path, and I'm, and I'm glad I'm sharing this with you and in our uh, in our mutual communities. So, what kept you coming back after you thought you were going to get this started and step back? Well, I wanted to initially see where it was going and, and how it was developing. You know, in, in our, you know, I, as as a footnote to all this. Um, you know, I have a lot of, I think a lot about, about culture and about the values that hold us as a people. And I'm always checking into, and, and I think it's healthy that we question those values from time to time, you know, just to kind of check into them. And, um, and then I tried to represent, you know, the, the uh, spiritual foundations, well, the foundations, everything is spiritual, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the foundations of our, our peoples and our faith traditions. And um, and that's what I strive to reflect all the time kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to abandon my friends, you know, <laughs> kind of thing like that. Um, so, you know, I, I, would, I would stay maybe the first few meetings and, and then 
as as the relationship is budding and growing, then I didn't necessarily need to be there kind of thing. But as it turns out, you know, um, needs come up and, uh, and, and possibilities come up and, uh, and, and I seem to be uh, a fit for those possibilities. And uh, it's always easy to, to hang with my friends and then developing new friends with CVP and yourself. You, you tell a story about a moment when you decided within yourself that you could stay or this was worthwhile. Do you remember talking about that? Could you yeah. just say a little bit about that? Because I think that's kind of critical. Kind of. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this was in unity or friendship, one of those communities, you know. And, uh, and up until that time, you know, we were, we were just kind of, um, you know, maybe surfacing some of the... Uh, you know, getting to know, you know, so we're kind of surfacing a lot of the, the, the ideas that uh, who we were and, and how we are. Um, but I needed to, if I was going to continue to participate in, in this, I needed to know that we were capable of, of delving into some really crucial issues. You know, um, not just Wampanoag and Wabanaki people, which are basically the same people, but you know, this is a this is a global issue that that entrenches the the diabolics of colonialism all throughout. You know, indigenous people. You know, there's like 600 million indigenous peoples in the world, and I suspect we all have the same story uh, and the same circumstances that we're working with, kind of thing. You know, um, and. You know, we were going through some really painful times at that time in the community. So I wanted to begin to share those kinds of issues, you know, really substantive issues that uh, in some cases are really life and death, you know. And, and, if, and if my thinking was if we were going to continue meeting and, and trying to understand the culture of the people, then we have to understand what is happening to that culture. Right. You know, and that maybe there are things that we can do about that together. You know? Yeah. 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 I, re I remember pretty trepidous about, <laughs> <laughs> about sharing that because I, 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 I felt that, well, you know, maybe that might be the end and maybe I would be the cause and everybody leaves. And You, you wanted know. to know if we'd still be there. Yeah. If, if you brought up yeah. the hard stuff. Yeah. 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 And you were. <laughs> And, and you know, and, and to a great relief, he was embraced. You know, and I really have a, a deep gratitude for how that developed and how it continued to develop. Yes, because it took all different kinds of directions over the years, and, and I just, I just, my own story, um, what about why I got involved and why I stayed was that you know I was aware that. I'd, my whole life I'd had a, an interest and a fascination with the lives of indigenous people. And, you know, as I got older, I began to realize that was a pretty romantic notion and not based in anything like fact. Um, and so when we met and we first started talking about the gatherings being an educational kind of forum, you know, I was really interested because I wanted to learn more and I wanted to get to know people who were Wabanaki. And, uh, you know, but we, we tell the story in the book of how after the, um, the second gathering that we had, you and some other Wabanaki came up to me because I, by that time I had become kind of the coordinator of the whole thing. Um, and you said, you know, we think this has promise, but we'd like to suggest that we meet a different way, a way that we're more comfortable. And we'll take care of all of that. We'll take care of the, the form and the structure of the meeting. And you do what you're good at, which is organizing people and getting them here. And, um, and we said, yes, of course, we would love that. And 
so what I wanted to say about that is that as we began to meet in, in a circle over these long weekends, that what began to happen to me was um, in that circle was a feeling as the story, and we had no agenda, you know, it was just to take that talking stick and if we felt moved to speak, to speak about our lives and our story. And then it just went around and around throughout the days and, and the weekends. And um, I began to feel in myself this filling up, this sense that some great void that had been there, I'll call it a wound, was, was being attended to, was being healed. And, you know, it was like something being healed that you didn't know was there. You didn't know something was wrong, but suddenly, it, and it was very moving. Um, and I would say that feeling was what kept me coming back in some really fundamental way. And, you know, I, um, I come back, I've thought a lot about, um, some of the words that Barb Martin says um, in our book, because she's a, for our listeners, she's a Mi'kmaq woman from uh, New Brunswick. And she was um, a bit of a skeptic about this whole operation at first. And she talks about observing these circles. And she said that she became aware that they were really different from the all native circles that she'd been used to. And she said, it felt like the white people were sort of coming from their heads in what they would say, it was very intellectual. And, and but she said, when, but then they would get, something would happen and they would just start to weep and they would become so emotional in the circle. And it puzzled her for a while. And she said she began to feel that, that what was happening to them was that they were becoming whole in the circle and that they weren't used to this. They were overwhelmed by the feelings. And she said, I wondered where that came from. And I began to feel that it, it, was, it was like an emptiness, like they wanted to belong and suddenly they felt like they belonged and it was, it was overwhelming to them. And, you know, I witnessed that too. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. If you, um, if you recall that or recall some of your thoughts during the time and where you think, where you think that came from. Well, you know, I, I... The the, uh, the the mega story and connections to what you're just sharing is rampant through this hemisphere. You know, um, I think I think about. Well, I recall a time when uh, the late John Mohawk was talking about. He was a history professor. Uh, Seneca man talking about his uh, uh, his inquiry to what was happening in Europe, you know, and so he was really cognizant of the ins and outs of, of European history and, and then how that came here. Um, you know, and the, the, the legacy from the moment that that families started to arrive you know, in Plymouth, what's now Plymouth off the Mayflower. It's the first time that families were here. And that changed the whole whole focus a little bit, the whole, you know, the, 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 the question that, uh, that Wampanoag people had no particular need to have Europeans coming here because it, up until that time, they were just explorers or they were gathering people for slavery and so forth. You know, so they were never allowed to stay. We would always push them out. But this time, there are families here. There are women and children. You know, and that had a different perspective. From that moment, 
um, it, it seems like several of the what we what what I understand the church to talk about is in the forms of deadly sins. Um, that that there was less a spiritual connection with the land and more of a resource extraction with the land, you know, a way of being wealthy kind of thing, you know, and this this became this happened with the pilgrims, with the separatists, and then with the Puritans coming after that. And it just a steady snowballing effect, you know, to where we are now. Um, but there's that kind of estrangement in my mind, you know, there's an estrangement that I remember my, my uh, dear friend, Nani Pashman was sharing that he could just envision what the, what, what uh, our earliest councils with, with the English, you know, and, and, uh, and he had this vision that um, one of the, the principles representing, representing Wampanoag people would lean over and say quietly to his fellow me, in, in the context of this relation, this meeting, it says, we're not dealing with normal people here, <laughs> kind of thing, you know? Uh, you know, in meaning that there was such a, 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 a wide gap between how we looked at life and how we lived our life mm -hmm. and how the people coming here were starting to live their lives, you know, very, very vastly different. Um, and then over the course of, of, of history here, you know, you know, if, if we weren't experiencing deadly diseases, we were experiencing violence in all capacities and so forth. And it, and it, it intrigues me that the ultimate connection, the ultimate resolve to this is for now the people of North America and all the other nation states in this hemisphere, um, to realize that living in this side of the world anyways, as we, as we are very familiar with it, is not about the kind of culture that they've developed here. And we're not necessarily saying leave us kind of thing, but it's like picking up where it was left off in those early encounters with the separatist English. Because the original treaties that we, we held with Plymouth Colony was actually introducing them there to, to the natural ways of the Wampanoag, how to live here, mm -hmm. and how to live here with, with an understanding that it's not just life between us as human beings, it's a relationship with all the life around us, you know. And uh, some people, and, and I think I, I, I remember uh, in one of our gatherings, um, this woman, I like to say her name was Mary Ann, but she was, uh, uh, she had recently moved to South Dakota for a number of years. Uh, she was uh, uh, a minister in, in, a, in a congregation where she was of her faith and she was a little bit bewildered and she took a moment out of our gathering. And, uh, we were kind of talking a little bit. She said that when she first moved to South Dakota, she had this um, real close affinity to this plant. She didn't know what the plant was, uh, but it was really close to her. And, and she developed a relationship. She honored that, that plant. And then later on, she finds, finds out this plant is very significant in the, in the ceremonial life and traditions of the Lakota people with sage. And then she felt a little bewildered and, and and I told her that, you know, it, it's not so much a form of a cultural appropriation. It's more like the earth reaching out to you and you are open and you receive this relationship. And that's where we want to get people to have this kind of relationship to the land, like we have a relationship to the land. And I think that is, that's that problematic thing that people are striving for. Because what was, according to John Mohawk, that severance from the land took place in, in, in various histories and, and, and legacies in Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the, the so-called pagan rituals were really earth-based rituals that my ancient grandmas and grandpas would really understand and resonate with, mm -hmm. you know. 
and it, and it sort of bewilders me a little bit that even biblically speaking among Christians that talk about God's creation and, and, and the, the historic uh, process of, of bringing in different forms of life, you know, that, that, that God is blessing all this part and God is within all these parts. And yet that sentiment and, and that very deep vibrational relationship to what was created, other life forms, doesn't seem to, to fit in common American society or even church ideology. You know, we acknowledge that this is God's creation, but we go out and destroy it. We have no relationship to it kind of thing, you know. So, you know, that, that's what I think about when I'm, I'm listening to this, that there is this, this deep void, you know, in, 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 in people. Fortunately, despite the whole history that we've been through um, with America, <laughs> with Americans and Canadians, um, there's always this growing connection that we're crossing paths with and we're starting to restabilize one another and we're starting to, to, to enable people to have that sense of connection with the land too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our common future. That's where we have to go to that. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? <laughs> very, very much. And, you know, I'm thinking as you're talking that, uh, you know, contrary to what we, the non-natives thought in those circles that we were getting into, um, I think we were, we realized along the way that we were there to heal ourselves. Um, you know, it was, the the Wabanaki people were so um, vulnerable and transparent about the struggles in their lives, and you could hear that, and you could feel um, empathy um, and um, and sorrow for that. And at the same time, we were confronted with. Um, the deep connection that against all odds they seem to still have not only with the land but with one another their family connections and i think it was painful for us to some of us certainly me um to recognize that and so many of us live scattered all over everywhere and um have lost some of that, not all of us, but you know, some of that connection with the land, certainly where we were born. You know, we we've moved around a lot and and um uh you know it it was painful sometimes and yet we would feel um shy about talking about that because we you sort of felt like in comparison to what indigenous people have experienced, you know, you can't complain kind of thing, but it, it was, it was a, it was painful sometimes to realize what we'd lost. And um, I just, um, I, I just began to feel that, you know, maybe we were really called there to heal ourselves. I mean, I um, just in, I mean, I grew up in a system that was literally called segregation. Talk about disconnection, you know, and to feel accepted by and connected to the Wabanaki people in that circle was a very healing experience. Um, in a very small, very small way, my my parents, the first house they owned was taken by eminent domain um, to build a highway. And my family sort of never recovered from that financially. And, and so, you know, I would be able to somehow connect in a small way with the stories of displacement and um, feel, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was, it was like a weaving together of something in those circles. Um, I've been thinking about the idea of being called 
to engage in in what we engaged in and uh, it feels as if it was a calling in a way. And you and I've talked a little bit about, you know, what a calling might, how it might be understood in your culture. Um, but I, I, I sort of think of paying attention to that kind of call to a calling as being aware of a movement of the spirit. And um, I, I just wondered if, um, if you could say a little bit about how you pay attention to a movement of the spirit as you understand it. Um, you were clearly called in some way to be part of this whole endeavor that we were involved in. As, as a segue to that, you know, as, as you were just sharing a little earlier, um, you know, and I think this is true for most, for most people, most indigenous peoples here, you know, is, is that we see that, we see that in our neighbors, you know, we see that emptiness and that, that bewilderment kind of thing and we and and the the loss of connection to the land and, and it's not lost on us you know and in, in, in ways in many ways that keeps us engaged to to opportunities to mm. to meet together and to, to to try to figure out how it is that we're going to live here in the same space you know that's that's the unfinished business you know that's the the early treaties with uh bet between well then the uh the incoming colonists and then afterwards with the united states and canada mm -hmm. those treaties were, were more about relationships than the political legal savvy that we talk about treaties today you know those were about bringing people into the longhouse, if you will, establishing relationships, because that's our experience, you know. Maybe we didn't call them treaties in those days, but we did talk about making relatives, mm. you know, and, and that's that's the emphasis. So in thinking about what, you're, what we're talking about now, how we're being called, um, that is an aspect of the established relationship that we already have with earth in sky with all the all the life around us that 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 contributes to who we are that identifies us um, otter clan for instance or turtle clan you know or the many other out there you know what Miga Mahan, my partner you know she's uh, she's loon and she's also fish, fish clan kind mm -hmm. of thing, you know. There's not a moment that that in our in our the wholeness of our life that we are not ever connected to the life around us. The life around us and and um, you know, you know, we're 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 the children of earth, you know, and, and the earth is our mother in, in very esoteric uh visceral ways you know it's true for us this is our reality probably sounds like science fiction to people who, who don't live like that but that's our reality you know so so the the sense for me personally of being called to something is really an extension of our conversation that we have between us you know my my helpers out there you know or or you know, there's there's opportunities that come up, and then I see that um, there's this is a, a valuable moment that I can contribute. I see myself as a helper. You know, mm -hmm. I I I I don't particularly are um, uh, move to the to the uh, um, to to the to the musical interlude of titles and so forth like that, you know, that's, but it's how I can contribute to any given situation. And sometimes just the moment, 
in, in seeing that there's a need in that moment is a calling, you know, we have, we have a responsibility to each other, not just as human beings, but all life around us, you know. So the calling is always present. It's always there. It's how we respond. And it's the nature of our ongoing relationship and their, the communication that we hold with the life around us, you know. And then when it comes to the relationship between us as people, well, this is kind of quirky etiquette that we won't respond to those kinds of needs unless we're invited to it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll send good thoughts out there, you know, we, we might pray for those people. Um, but if they really need our intervention, they'll, they'll ask us about it. You know, they, there's different ways they ask about it, but and the reason I believe is that in their life, you know, um, it's an opportunity for them to sit with what it is they're feeling. And we don't want to intervene in that process, you know. And we want we want them to experience how they resolve and to allow for that resolve to take place. And, you know, I've been there many times personally, and I know what that means kind of thing, you know. And so, you know, our normal relationship, unless those that, you know, the people who are going through this are little ones, then we certainly we intervene and certainly, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, maybe young adults kind of help guide them a little bit. But people of our own age, you know, people a little bit older, you know, we, we're there, we're supportive. But we won't intervene unless we're asked to. You know? mm -hmm. So, I, you know, that's how I look at this. You know, it's, it, for us, it's more about the relationship and responding in the relationship. You know. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit to the gatherings and ask you if you know. It was kind of amazing to us that Wabanaki people, um, including yourself, hung in there for all those years. And, you know, I, I wonder if, if you could express what it was that you think um, kept people, Wabanaki people in particular, engaged what was happening there that you think made them think it was worthwhile to be there we we invest every one of us invested huge amounts of time we traveled hundreds of miles um it was a long term commitment do you have some thoughts about that oh, i always have thoughts <laughs> I'm always bewildered by thoughts. You know? <laughs> they don't stop coming. You know? <laughs> um, well, it, up into a time, you know, you know, maybe the the, the earliest or earliest encounters with the gatherings, you know, um, you know, this was in the explore. You know, we were exploring. You know, and you know, we we can't ever stop. I don't think it's possible to ever stop developing friendships and in, in, in the exploration about where this might lead us to and then the opportunities that come to this. But I think at some point, and it's really hard to, to have a sense of when that some point was, uh, but we, we stopped being explorers in the relationship and we started to be friends, you know, and to where you and I are now, we're, we're really family. That's how I feel. You know, and at some point, I think, I think that friendship was, well, you know, picking up where, where, where the needs are, but it was really coming from a sense of friendship. Maybe we didn't talk about it. In, I'm sure we didn't talk about it in terms of, uh, the, you know, the established treaty relationships and how this manifests as a treaty relationship kind of thing and this is the expectations 
perhaps from a treaty relationship. It's not just between nations, it's between the peoples of the nations as well. This is how we implement those things. Uh, I don't think we were, you know, coming out of this as a treaty relationship. But we were coming out of a mutual concern and, and the trust has already been established there. You know, I, I, I recall our gatherings, we had really frank discussions, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but, but it was a safe, it, you know, it has developed at that point safe enough to really share and maybe in the emotion of that sharing, always respectful, of course. Um, but things that we needed to say and, and they were, and we were all open to what needed to be said. And then in some cases where maybe some action needed to be done and we were all for it kind of mm -hmm. thing, you know? And, uh, you know, as much as the gatherings were supporting us, you know, on both sides, we were also there to support each other, you know? Um, naturally what friends do, you know? Yeah, and I, I recall, um, you know, it, in doing the interviews, the conversations for the book, I, I heard from the Wabanaki people things that I hadn't known at the time, which was, I recall Mikamahan saying that um, it was the first time she felt confirmed. Like, it, you know, it's like, no matter how much we can tell ourselves we don't need someone else's um, opinion or good opinion of us. We're human beings. And so to have um, mirrored back her, the value of her words and, and being believed, you know, that, you know, it was shocking to me in a way that she said, that was maybe her first experience of that. Um, and I heard that from other Wabanaki people too. Well, you know, that's the, the obvious aspect of that is we don't have, you know, the, 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 the gatherings represented a forum, right? Where we can meet and we can discuss, uh, we can put aside, I mean, we can, deconstruct the, um, the, mel the melodramas around us and the, and the false narratives and so forth. You know, we had, this was a forum where we could do that, you know, mm -hmm. and as we're deconstructing these things, we are constructing something different. The way I envisioned my ancestors thinking about how we were going to bring people into the longhouse, and what that would look like mm -hmm. kind of thing. We never really got to that, you know, but I think that initially that was the whole idea, you know, and so uh, and I remember a lot of discussions that Miga Mahan and I were having about the nature of this because she was she was pretty skeptical about <laughs> initially, you know, yeah. uh, but, you know, there, there came that moment that, that she really began to see that this wasn't about um you know, new age stuff. This was real stuff. You know, this was real, real relationships. You know, and, and that we were we were telling the truth. Mm -hmm. We were coming from that. You know, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I kind of think of this. You know, you reminded me of it. I I have this whole history of of really uh, amazing encounters with creation. You know, and and there's a a, a kind of uh, well, you know, you talked a little bit about romantic, romanticizing something, you know. So we we have as younger people, we kind of romanticize some of the stories that we've we've heard, you know. And one of those those stories was always about that we would never doing we would never enter into something, doing something, without first having a vision of it or first having some 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 sign, quote unquote, about that. And I was on my way to Boston one time and I was riding in the bus and, and I had the window seat and I was looking out and I was saying, you know, looking for a sign is kind of an act of faithlessness, you know, that if we, re if we really believe in what we want to do, then, then let's conjure up all the energy we can to do it, you know. 
And I had come to that conclusion, I'm not going to look at a sign. I'm not going to look for signs anymore. And the moment I came to that, there was this beautiful hawk in my vision. <laughs> sign. <laughs> You know, and some of those encounters that I have with creation are just so confirming, you know, just so, you know, maybe just one, one other time. <laughs> my, my tribal bros and I, we were uh, up all night. Well, pretty much, maybe about, about three o'clock. And, and we, you know, we were kind of talking about, you know, what we can do for the community kind of thing, you know. And so we thought, let's look for a space. And... Uh, and, and uh, let's build a longhouse. We have ceremonies and things like that in the longhouse. So we were all really kind of, oh, yeah, let's go do this. So we decided such and such a time we're going to meet. And, uh, and then we'll start looking around, you know. So about maybe five of us, maybe six, you know. So I showed up at, the, at that appointment at that time. They weren't there, you know. So I stuck around for an hour where he showed up, you know. So at some point I got a, a little um, arrogant about it and I said, I'm going to stay here until they show up. And they never showed up for nine months. I stayed there for nine months. <laughs> they never showed up. But, <laughs> but what an amazing... That's the I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of... But what an amazing experience that was living in the bush by myself for nine mm -hmm. months mm -hmm. you know and I got to see so many amazing things you know, you know and, and one of the I, I had deer and snakes uh, and birds all around me they were my neighbors you know and I could tell when the deer were talking about me because you, you, when you're out there long enough the, the, the deer have this amazing vocabulary you know you start to hear different different tonalities. And the word for deer uh, in my language is atuk, you know, and, and it's, and atuk is described as the ones with the wet noses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's, that's kind of really cover, colorful notion of these things, but being out there for those nine months, I got to see where that, where atuk applied because the vast vocabulary of deer are, is nasal. So they're, they, they speak to each other in nasal sounds so that their noses are always wet. But in an aha moment kind of thing. And then, then I began to see how our language is really a language that comes to us from our relationship to the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, what an amazing, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's that human experience that I think all cultures of the world had at one time in their experience. I know cultures in, in Africa and Asia still have those experiences. They're still connected, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think in some parts, even here in the United States and Canada, that, that there are people out there who are developing such relationships with the land. And I think that's where, when we get to there as a society, when we get to that point as a society, I think our future will be guaranteed on this earth. Up until that time, you know, this is really tenuous experiences that we're having, you know. And it occurs to me that when we get to that place, we non-Indigenous people get to that place, that's where we can truly be in, in authentic relationship with Indigenous people because um, then we're not simply trying to help uh, a cause um, or a people. We're we're working together for our our common survival, and we have a lot to learn from each other. And but before we go, um, because I'm beginning to be a, aware of the time, is you know um, people may not know that. You know, our gatherings ended in 1993, um, but many of us by that time had formed friendships and, and um, connections that lived on and lived on until in 2008, we um, 
those of us involved in this book decided to, to do this book together. Um, and I, I think one of the reasons we wrote the book is because we knew that not everyone can have the experience we did. We knew how fortunate we had been to be able to spend that kind of time together and not everyone can. And yet we felt that what we lear had learned about the relationship, about being in relationship, we wanted to share. And I, I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts about you know, other ways that you've experienced with non-native people, particularly, um, how, how can people have some of that experience as they come together? What are the elements that are important, whether or not you're meeting around a fire for um, eight years, seven years and, and, you know, have you had that experience? Other Western equivalents of of anything like what we experienced. Mm -hmm. Thinking Probably about not, huh? just thinking about going forward, all of us, you know, how we can bring some of that experience in into our lives and our communities. And well, I think you know, I, I I recall a statement from Martin Luther King Jr. Who is talking about how we how we fear each other? You know, uh, as a society, we fear each other. You know, and and, uh, and the reason for that fear is is that we don't know each other, and the reason we don't know each other is because we don't talk to each other. You mm -hmm. know, the the ultimate form of of separation kind of thing, and 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 when we don't have that opportunity to talk with each other, then we form you know, really, well, false narratives about each other. We make assumptions and we think this is the way things are. And I think most, you know, most uh, North Americans have a sense of, of indigenous people as being human people and in, 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 in having the same corruptibility as everybody else has, you know. And this was played, and this played out in burnt church over the fishing kind of thing, yeah. you know, and the, and the and the violence around the the francophone and the anglophone because they thought we would do the same like they would if given the opportunity, and of mm -hmm. course we didn't. And it's not about building the great ark and shipping everybody home; it's about coming to a place in that time and putting the the, the effort into understanding each other the only way we're going to be able to do it is that we have to talk to each other you know and it's not just you know a, a weekend forum or kind of thing we really have to open up you know and, I, and, and i'm having the same dialogue with with some of the um, um organizations that i'm working with along the same leg along the same idea one is to begin to disenfranchise the false narratives that are around us uh, in the form of educating the educators. And then there's, you know, climate change conversations that we're having. Mm -hmm. um, there's relationships of, of, the, of, of church peoples uh, throughout Canada that, that are very open to trying to figure out, one, they're making similar apologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how do, how do we recoup the relationship, you know, kind of thing, you know? And it's all about, we got to, we have to, well, for me, probably the easiest way is, is a, a very natural way. Um, and that is, you know, sometimes I get really skeptical sometimes about whether or not it's possible. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just meet somebody at random on the street and I'll say hello and they say hello and then they smile and we smile and then we can have a conversation kind of thing, you know. I think we really have to be deliberate in in our in our breaking down the barriers because as we experienced, maybe that took a while to really get to know each other and, and to trust the scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to invest in that, but the but the framework is that we have to do this intentionally, uh, and and it and it can't be anything other than our our full 
earnest, um, our integrity to put this forward, you know, and I believe that, you know, it's, we can't single out any institution or organization though, but, you know, the, the American friends have a long history of doing that with Indian country, you know, uh, those, you know, and I really appreciate the, the, um, uh, sand, sandwich friends house, you know, that, that they, they make periodic relationships with the people. Who, and when we begin to have these over, then there's a trust, you know, then we can sit down, we can kind of, yeah. And, and what we need to do is map out what our future is going to look like. Mm -hmm. You know, so we bring, we bring in Indian country into this, we bring North America into this, we sit down and we map out what the future is going to look like, but we do that together little bit us, a little bit you, we map this out. Maybe there won't be an entity called the United States or Canada. Maybe it'll be something completely different, but something that, that the people of the land and the people coming to the land will create, you know, but it'll always be us. And it'll always be us in a family relationship. You know, that's what I'm... Well, that's, that's a very... That's a very that's generous, <laughs> generous sentiment. <laughs> well, that's the mischief that I'm making out there in the world, you know. Good. It's good trouble, as yeah. John Lewis said. <laughs> yeah. um, any other last thoughts? That's a pretty good well, one. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna tease you, you know. What what do you know about last thoughts? <laughs> This this is this is an ongoing relationship. This there is, is no ongoing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I look forward to you know I look forward to to uh, to growing more deeply in this relationship and and welcome anybody anybody out there that has the courage and the bravery uh, to commit to a relationship as as this. It's there. It's been you know Indian countries have been waiting for this. A long time, you know, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I hear that that the um, uh, American friends are developing an apology uh, to Indian country. Yes, you know, well, maybe that is the the the, the cornerstone to developing a relationship. You know, a lot of the powwows that that you know, people might might hear their their uh, indigenous neighbors are usually open to the public, you know? If people start to see your face long enough, you know, and they're gonna wonder why, what keeps you coming here, you know, kind of thing. And, yeah. it's, you know, there's there's so many different opportunities to develop relationships. People in the classrooms, you know, people, uh, I don't know, we, we have interest, you know, and certainly the, the, the climate scenario is, a, is of great, but, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, any kind of response that comes out of society. And I remember having this conversation with Ellie mm -hmm. after being invited to her, to address her class. And then, you know, we're riding back to her home and she was saying, how can I duplicate you? You know, how can I get more of you? You know, and, and, and it's not about me so much. It's about paying attention to the anomalies that are around us that we regard as normal, you know, poverty, you know, class systems, you know, why do we hold on to, to values that, that hurt people, you know, and, uh, and separate people, you know, I, I, I think, you know, when we begin to explore those obvious issues around us, then that's what we need to do. We need to really pay attention and, and commit our faiths to practice and not something that we hear once in a while and do once in a while, but we have to live those out. You know? yeah. Yeah. It's been a blessing uh, sharing this space with you. Yes, yeah. same here, Gisitana Mook. And uh, I don't have any better last thoughts than that, <laughs> except to express my deep gratitude for you and for this opportunity from New England Yearly Meeting. And um, if it's all right with you, I'm ready to close and open up some space 